Eating is essential for human survival, but our daily choices have definitely changed over time. Today, we enjoy a huge variety of foods, and most people wouldn't want to eat the same thing every day. This is pretty different from how things were in prehistoric times. It makes you wonder, what did early humans actually eat? In this video, we'll talk about the yummy diets of prehistoric Europe, how they grew their crops, and how they raised animals. We'll also take a look at their dining habits and the unique challenges they faced with farming and food. But before we proceed, kindly hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up to keep enjoying our amazing contents. With that said, let's keep things moving. After the last ice age, Europe warmed up and the climate became more stable. During the Mesolithic era, hunter-gatherers in Europe thrived across different landscapes from the Atlantic coast in the west to the river valleys of the eastern steppes. Then, around 7000 BC, the first Neolithic farmers from the Aegean region in southeastern Europe started spreading across the continent in two major waves. They brought exciting new ways of life, fresh languages, new beliefs, and social structures, transforming Europe along the way. Around 3000 BC, another big shift took place, when herders from the Ponic steppe in what is now southern Russia and Ukraine spread across Europe marking the start of the Bronze Age. These three eras brought amazing changes in society, language, and even genetics. But one of the most striking shifts was in how people thought about food. Every day, people in these societies put a lot of effort into finding enough to eat. But food also carried a much deeper significance for them. What people ate depended on what was available around them, what they could grow or raise themselves, and what they could trade for. The resources they used were shaped by the tools they had and their unique cultural traditions. During the Mesolithic era, groups of hunters, fishers, and foragers thrived in many different landscapes across Europe. While we might picture these pre-farming societies as constantly wandering, they were actually less mobile than we might think, often settling in places where food was abundant. For Mesolithic Europeans, this often meant living by the coast, where they could gather massive amounts of shellfish. We know this partly because of the many shell middens left behind large mounds of discarded shells that built up over generations. These ancient communities left these shell piles as a kind of marker of their way of life, sometimes creating impressive mounds that stood the test of time. These shell mounds, found all the way from Denmark and the British Isles down to Ireland and Portugal, give us amazing insights into ancient life. Careful excavation shows us that Mesolithic people gathered, cooked, and enjoyed oysters, periwinkles, mussels, limpets, whelks, cockles, scallops, and even crab and lobster. Fish like pollock, dogfish, rays, and trout were also on the menu. Shellfish and seafood gave them high-quality protein and essential nutrients, healthy fats, iron, zinc, magnesium, and important vitamins. In areas with seals, these animals were a valuable food source, too. Coastal communities, especially in places like Norway and Denmark, specialized in seal hunting, benefiting from their skins, bones, oils, and nutrient-rich meat. Seal blubber was also packed with calories, which helped support larger communities. These coastal groups didn't depend only on the sea for food. They also hunted boar, elk, red and roe deer, aurochs, and smaller game on land. In early northern Sweden, for instance, reindeer were an important part of their diet. Not all Mesolithic people lived by the sea either. At Starkar in North Yorkshire, England, people lived near a lake surrounded by woodlands where they hunted animals like roe deer, beaver, badger, and hedgehog. They also ate birds like the great crested grebe, common crane, and lapwing, along with freshwater fish. It's important to note that not all animal remains found at these ancient sites were necessarily for food. Some animals were likely hunted for their fur or feathers. Still, the meat was probably enjoyed as well. Mesolithic people didn't just eat animals, though. They also gathered and ate plants. While plant remains are harder for archaeologists to find, sites like Star Car show a landscape filled with edible plants like bulrushes, blackberries, pears, apples, raspberries, crowberries, and water lilies, all of which people could have prepared and eaten. One food that leaves clear evidence under the right conditions is hazelnuts. Mesolithic people across Europe loved hazelnuts. In places like Duvense in northern Germany, there's strong evidence of seasonal gathering and careful processing of hazelnuts at special sites. They would roast the nuts in batches in earth ovens, which not only improved their flavor, but also extended their shelf life and made them easier to crack and grind. Turning roasted hazelnuts into flour or paste reduced their weight and volume, making them easier to carry around. In Scotland, we see similar patterns of hazelnut gathering. On the island of Colonsai, 
Archaeologists found a pit holding 30,000 to 40,000 charred hazelnuts, along with crab, apples, seeds, charcoal, and stone tools. The pit may have been used to dispose of a batch of accidentally charred nuts, suggesting they were roasting between 120,000 and 330,000 hazelnuts at this site. Even just a day or two of roasting could produce millions of calories, a hugely valuable resource for people across temperate Europe. Many people assume that Mesolithic foragers lived entirely differently from the Neolithic farmers who came after them, that they didn't manage plants and animals or alter their environments. But that's not quite right. Domestication was a long, gradual process, and Mesolithic hunter-gatherers often used sophisticated ways to manage wild plants and animals without fully domesticating them. These early people had strategies to boost the productivity of plants around them. They tended to plants, used controlled burns in woodlands, weeded, and even improved soil quality. Although they may not have planted wild seeds in the way we think of farming today, it's possible they did some sowing too. Archaeologists analyze ancient pollen to understand these prehistoric landscapes, since certain plants, shrubs, and trees only grow in specific conditions. This research has shown that Mesolithic woodlands across Europe were regularly cleared, with some areas kept open over long periods. These clearings encouraged edible shrubs to thrive, especially hazel. Some experts believe they can even track the spread of hazel woodlands beyond their natural ranges, suggesting that Mesolithic communities might have used early farming-like methods to create and maintain wild hazelnut orchards for seasonal gathering. Incredibly, Mesolithic people didn't just manage plants, they managed animals too. In areas where animals were scarce, they even brought new species in. One fascinating example is the possibility that the land snail Sepea nemoralis was brought from Iberia to Ireland during the Mesolithic. Genetic evidence suggests that Mesolithic foragers may have been raising or farming these land snails as a food source, a practice that began in Iberia and spread to Ireland. After the last ice age, as glaciers melted and sea levels rose, many islands across the Atlantic and Mediterranean lost certain animal species. By studying archaeology and genetics, researchers can tell when different species were brought to these islands by humans specifically for hunting. For instance, wild boar were introduced to places like Ireland, where they were also carefully managed through regular hunting. Astonishingly, it seems that people even brought brown bears to Ireland. Imagine how this might have worked. Young animals were likely taken after their mothers were killed, then transported by canoe to these islands, where they could establish breeding populations for future hunting. Wild boar were also introduced to several Aegean islands during the Mesolithic. The same region, the Aegean, later became the starting point for Europe's first farmers, who spread across the continent with domesticated plants and animals, leaving a lasting impact on Europe's landscape. In Europe's temperate and Mediterranean regions, there were once 200 to 450 types of wild edible plants, including green leafy plants, seaweed, roots, nuts, grass seeds, and fruits. Many of these plants were abundant near wetlands, lake shores, and along the coastlines, places that also attracted communities of hunter, fishers, and foragers. The Neolithic period in Europe brought a big shift as people began farming and raising animals as their main sources of food. This new lifestyle focused on cultivating just a few staple crops like cereals and pulses and raising domesticated animals like sheep, goats, cattle, and pigs. While the switch to farming led to some health challenges, People were generally shorter, faced more diseases, and had more dental problems than their hunter, fisher, forager ancestors. It allowed communities to produce more food. This stable food supply helped people settle in one place, leading to higher birth rates and growing populations. This farming lifestyle began in the Fertile Crescent and reached the Aegean around 7000 BC. From there, it spread in two main directions. One route led down along the Mediterranean coast to Iberia, while the other moved through the Balkans and into Central Europe. By around 4000 BC, farming had spread all the way to Northern Europe, including the British Isles and Ireland. These changes brought about a new way of life in Europe, setting the stage for settled communities, growing populations, and eventually the rise of civilizations. It was the beginning of a new chapter, with farming practices that would shape Europe's landscape and societies for generations to come. Neolithic farmers cultivated a variety of domesticated crops, including einkorn and emmer wheat, hulled barley, and pulses like peas, lentils, and chickpeas. 
They raise pigs, sheep, goats, and cattle, using these animals for meat and also for milk, which they turn into different dairy products. Archaeologists can analyze ancient food residues preserved in pottery to learn more about what people ate. In early Greek farming communities, there's clear evidence of dairy consumption, showing that milk was an important part of their diet from the start. As farming spread through the Balkans into Central Europe, cattle became increasingly central to these communities. Even though most people back then were lactose intolerant, they didn't let that stop them from enjoying dairy. By making cheese, yogurt, and butter, they processed milk into forms that were easier to digest. Some people could even drink raw milk without major issues. It wasn't until the Bronze Age when herders from the steppes of Europe introduced a gene for adult lactose tolerance that people across Europe began digesting milk more easily. Over time, this ability to consume milk spread widely, although we still don't fully understand all the reasons behind it. By the late Neolithic, areas like the North European Plain, Britain, and especially Ireland began relying more on dairy and cattle herding than on growing crops. Interactions between farmers and hunter-gatherers were complex and varied, with sites like Lipensky Veer on the Danube showing evidence of mixing between the two ways of life. This blending happened throughout Europe, though the larger farming populations meant that their culture and lifestyle eventually became dominant. Interestingly, Neolithic farmers largely avoided eating freshwater fish or seafood, despite living near rivers, lakes, and coasts. The reason is still a bit of a mystery. Maybe they were just so focused on farming that fishing took a back seat, or they might have even developed a cultural preference to avoid fish, perhaps because it was associated with hunter-gatherers. Still, they hunted wild animals to add variety to their diets, showing they knew how to make the most of their resources. These Neolithic communities were resourceful and resilient, finding creative ways to adapt their diets to their needs and changing environments. Their practices laid the foundation for a farming culture that would shape Europe for generations. Studying prehistoric food and dining habits has been brought to life thanks to some incredible archaeological finds. One of the most fascinating examples is the discovery of food preserved in the stomach of the Tyrolean Iceman, a man from the Chalcolithic era. This unique find offers us a glimpse into exactly what someone from that time ate in their last hours, providing a direct look into ancient diets that we rarely get to see. Looking at how prehistoric European diets evolved reveals an amazing story of human adaptation and innovation. We can trace a path from the diverse foods eaten by Mesolithic hunter-gatherers to the more stable but narrower choices of Neolithic farmers and then to the broader range of foods enjoyed by Bronze Age communities. Each step shows how people adapted to their environment and how food choices shaped society in return. These dietary shifts had a big impact on populations over time, affecting everything from people's height and health to the size and structure of communities. Although early hunter-gatherers may have been healthier as individuals, farming communities could sustain larger populations, which eventually helped farming cultures thrive and spread. Modern archaeological techniques keep uncovering new clues about ancient diets, from analyzing residue in pottery to studying preserved plant remains. Each find adds another piece to the puzzle, showing us more about how ancient Europeans lived, ate, and adapted to their changing world. And this is just the beginning. Our understanding of prehistoric human diets and evolution is constantly evolving, with new discoveries and fresh ideas that make us rethink what we know. Now, we want to hear from you. Which ancient human diets or food traditions did you find the most fascinating? Are there any questions you have about how our early ancestors ate that we didn't cover in the video? Share your thoughts, questions, or even your own ideas in the comments below. Your feedback helps us understand what topics interest you and helps build a community of curious minds eager to learn more about our shared past. Don't forget to subscribe and tap the notification bell so you never miss our future videos on human evolution. Until next time, keep exploring, stay curious, and let's keep discovering the fascinating history of humanity.